Hello, my lovely Calimaris. This is Calimara here. Happy New Year and welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new to the pond, go ahead and take a dive. You might like it here. So, I said in my last video, if my Marinette redesign did well, I would do a part 2 with Adrian and you guys really came through. And that's why we're going to be giving him a rewrite and redesign today, just like Marinette. If you like my redesign videos, then be sure to follow my Instagram and Twitter because I always post my designs there early. You can join my Discord server too because I post exclusive sneak peeks there all the time and you can even have your input on it. All the links are in my description. To give you a rundown of how I'm structuring this video and how I usually structure my redesign videos, I will first be doing a character breakdown of Adrian, redesigning both his casual and cat noir suit, and suggesting alternatives to his story and character that in my opinion would help improve the story of Miraculous Ladybug while staying consistent to its current tone, genre, and target audience. Before I get into it, I want to address some comments that were made in my previous video because it's literally every other comment. So in that video, I said that Marinette was 13 years old and every one of you were like, uh, they're actually 15 to 16 years old because they're in high school. And all I want to say is not according to the Miraculous Wiki which was the source I used to fill in a lot of the gaps in my knowledge. And according to the wiki, Francois Dupont Academy is a middle school. There's a note on the page that says the French word college means junior high school slash middle school, which in France lasts four years starting in the French equivalent of the sixth grade until the ninth grade. They also cited that Marinette turns 14 in Bafana based on the 14 candles on her birthday cake, which was confirmed by crew member Ferry Gonzalez on Twitter. According to multiple characters in the episode Felix, a year has passed from Emily's disappearance, which happened before Origins. This is also supported by Thomas Astruck himself when he tweeted that all the events of the show happen in the same school year. So, the oldest that the characters have ever been in the show, including the end of season 4, is 14 years old. And if you have a problem with that, Go take it up with the Miraculous Wiki, alright? Don't shoot the messenger. But I would also argue that the characters being a year or two older actually makes things a lot worse because, I mean, there's reasonable doubt you can apply to young children doing questionable things, but if they're a bit older, it's more like, well, you would think they would know better. Oh, you want to know something else I found on the Miraculous Wiki that I've been terrorizing my Discord server with? Based on an official Miraculous Design concept book from 2020, the entire cast of Miraculous Ladybug, aside from the adults but including Marinette's mom, is under 5 feet tall. Marinette is 4 foot 4, Adrian is 4 foot 9 despite Gabriel being 7 foot 2, and Chloe is 4 foot 5. So do with that what you will. Once again, I want to put a disclaimer that this is not a video meant to trash Miraculous Ladybug, nor is it an attempt to apply adult logic to what is clearly meant to be a children's show. Like, I know these characters are written to be incredibly shallow, superficial, and annoying on purpose because kids like straightforward, unconfusing characters and romantic melodrama, but after being caught up with pretty much every Miraculous episode aside from season 4 because Australian Netflix doesn't have season 4 and I can't be bothered to look up alternative sources to watch, Maybe saying that it's a kid's show would be giving it too much credit. Kid's shows are actually pretty sophisticated nowadays. Heck, 90% of my favorite shows today are just kid's shows. We know more about psychology and childhood development than we did like 10 years ago and shockingly enough, it was discovered that children actually comprehend more than we think. So shows have begun to incorporate more and more complex themes and topics into their stories to keep up with these changing standards and the rate of which kids encounter those subjects, what with different family backgrounds and their access to the internet. 
Meanwhile, this show feels exactly like what a kid's show felt like in the early 2000s, and not in the nostalgic, cool, retro way, but in the outdated, this did not age well kind of way. This is the least egregious example, but can we please stop making main characters drop things or fall over all the time? Nobody thinks it's cute, Marinette. If anything, it makes me worry that you might have a brain tumor that's affecting your sense of balance and coordination. You should probably get it checked out. Interestingly enough, after I published that video, I actually got a lot of comments saying that seasons 3 and 4 were actually the best seasons because things happen and the story develops. The comments also said that a lot of what I was suggesting for Marinette gets addressed in seasons 3 and 4, or mostly season 4, but I've also had an equal amount of people in my Discord server and in my comments saying how season 4 was easily the worst for various other reasons. There is one comment in particular that I found pretty interesting, and it basically says that the show was put through production hell because the writing team was given a lot of restrictions on what they could do. Examples of the format that the writers were supposed to follow was that there can only be one villain per episode, no linearity, 20 minute episodes, and no dark topics. The comment also said that the show they managed to produce despite all these restrictions is already great. I thought it was an interesting take to discuss because upon first reading it, I was like, hmm, if that's true, then yeah, maybe it isn't entirely the writer's fault after all. But then I thought about it, and the thing is, there are a lot of kids shows, if not all kids shows today, that have those same restrictions and work with them that are just better shows. And MLB itself doesn't necessarily follow those restrictions all the time either. They've gone into darker topics and they featured more than one villain per episode. And there is linearity in the story, so I don't really know what's holding them back at this point. And yeah, season 3 actually forced the plot to move along a bit more, but the story they went with moving forward was a much more frustrating plot that isn't really fun for anyone to watch, especially not me. And in reality, it doesn't even progress the plot at all because they either retcon it by the end of the episode or the end of the season. It's all just an illusion of progress, like Yandere Simulator. A lot of stuff happens, but nothing necessarily changes in the status quo or impacts the show's structure in any meaningful way. I feel like I could probably make a whole video on just my thoughts about the show itself and like do a serious review or something, but that's not why we're here today. So let's talk about Adrian. I'm sure if you're watching this video, you know who Adrian is, probably more than I do, so I'll just keep it short and snappy for those of you watching who don't. Adrian is essentially the second main character in the series and the holder of the Cat Miraculous, which has the power of destruction. Along with the Ladybug Miraculous, they are the two oldest and most powerful Kwamis in existence and are meant to balance each other out. This isn't how it plays out in the show, but we'll get to that. Before I started this video, I once again asked my lovely Calimaris for episode recommendations. I do like having some degree of research and personal experience with topics I make videos about, so I wanted to watch episodes that really emphasize Adrian's character and what he's like. Surprisingly, a lot of you said that you could barely think of any, and I found that interesting considering Adrian is the show's other titular character. I did manage to get a few recommendations though, and I'm way more familiar with the series now than when I started. Let's just say I came out of it a worse person. But from what I've observed, Adrian is what you would call Mr. Perfect on the surface. He is a supermodel, a fencing prodigy, academically gifted, musically trained, and multilingual, being able to speak Mandarin and Japanese on top of his mother tongue, uh, presumably French, and understands Morse code. He is someone that can do it all. He's the complete package, a golden child, or so you would think. Unlike Marinette, Adrian comes from a more troubled home life. Spoiler alert, his mom is dead, 
and his dad not only neglects him but has purposefully endangered his life several times to achieve his own psychotic goals. Adrian was extremely isolated and sheltered, had no friends, and essentially lives a life that he almost has no say in whatsoever and has been entirely planned out for him. I can't help but relate to him because I understand how it feels to want to achieve perfection for your parents' love and approval, but always seeming to fall short, no matter how much you try or how well you did. And there's also the whole growing up alone and isolated thing, which I'm still struggling with today. I seriously have some choice words to say about Gabriel Agrest and how I think he is the show's biggest problem, but I'll save that for his own redesign video. Going back to Adrian, my biggest takeaway of him coming out of my watch through was this boy is depressed and this show really wasted this character. See, despite Adrian having such an interesting backstory and being such a large part of the show, they barely do anything with him except dangle him like a carrot on a stick to get Marinette to move the plot along. I couldn't help but feel that Adrian barely had a personality as his normal, untransformed self. Yes, he is shown to be immensely neglected and lonely and he has a good heart and all that, naive and sees only the best in people, sheltered as he was. Uh, occasionally the show allows him to stand up to his father, but that's him on a good day. On every other day, he's just… there. Not a single thought behind those eyes. Adrian as a character is possibly the most milk toast a person could be. Like, he exists, he's inoffensive, he doesn't make me want to pull my hair out or stop watching the show, but that's the problem. He never makes me feel anything. I know Adrian was written to be Mr. Perfect, but the show has delved into his more vulnerable, imperfect sides before and has shown us that they are capable of exploring that depth. But they don't. Especially when he's cat noir and they make him the butt of every joke. Yet as Adrian, they never let him mess up or step on people's toes or even accidentally hurt someone's feelings. You could easily think that Marinette was the one who grew up isolated and sheltered because clearly no normal, well-adjusted teen acts the way that girl does. So Adrian to me feels like an imitation gem. It's flawless and beautiful, but because it was artificially manufactured, it lacks the complexity and substance and worth of the real thing and thus it will always be valued less. Cat Noir, on the other hand, has the exact opposite problem. Cat Noir is a diamond in the rough. He's witty, playful, and goofy. He's scrappy, rough around the edges, but he's valiant and won't hesitate to sacrifice himself for others. And don't get me wrong, Cat Noir borders on being as big a creep as Marinette to the point I've gone, God, these two really deserve each other. But at least it's something. However, the show barely lets him do anything, whereas they never let Adrian mess up. Not in the same way Marinette or Chloe messes up because I know he technically leads Kagami on for a while, which is totally uncool because Kagami is the best character in the series, but compared to what the girls have pulled, that's practically nothing. Cat Noir is never allowed to succeed, especially not by himself. The show tries to make it seem like Cat Noir and Ladybug need each other because they're equals, but I've sat through every single fight scene and Cat Noir is always relegated to Ladybug's support. He has to constantly wait for her to arrive and tell him what to do. Even when he uses his cataclysm, he has to wait for Ladybug to tell him when and where to use it. She rarely listens to his suggestions and when she does, it's usually because she thinks it's her idea first. What I'm trying to say is, there's a very unhealthy power imbalance between Ladybug and Cat Noir, both literally and figuratively, but we'll get into their powers later. Where Ladybug treats Cat Noir more like he's a tool she can use than an actual partner, and the show treats Cat Noir more like a comic relief than Ladybug's equal. 
The show purposefully makes sure that Adrian is always left in the dark and kept out of the loop. You see this clearly in the episode Siren where Master Fu, aka the writer's proxy, tells Marinette not to say anything to Adrian because, oh ho ho, there's a time and place for everything. And Cat Noir is literally left waiting on a rooftop, understandably frustrated and upset, but still respects her boundaries and trusts that she's going to do the right thing. A similar thing happens in Antibug when Chloe as Antibug literally points out the power imbalance between him and Ladybug and the show addresses this by having Marinette say, I trust Cat Noir because we are a team. And the status quo goes back to exactly the way it was in the next episodes. Marinette should do politics with the amount of lip service and lack of action she does. But I guess she is class president. Why is Marinette treated like she's more important than Adrian when their Kwamis are meant to be the two most powerful and are intended to keep each other in balance? Why did Master Fu only want to speak to and guide Marinette, but not the person with the Kwami that could literally destroy the entire universe? I feel like it should be the opposite. Marinette is doing well, she's doing good for herself. <laughs> oh wait, no, I know why. It's because Miraculous Ladybug has a Tori Vega problem. For those of you who don't know who Tori Vega is, she's the main protagonist of a Nickelodeon series called Victorious, which is about a performing art school in Hollywood that's full of extremely talented and eccentric people. The show was really popular in the early 2010s, mostly because the show featured original songs and music that the characters would perform in almost every episode, kinda like Hannah Montana, and it was also where Ariana Grande made her big acting debut, I guess. However, a lot of people were frustrated by the show because it featured much more interesting characters played by more talented actors and singers than the actor that played the main lead. They literally had Ariana Grande and Liz Gillies as part of the cast, for God's sake. However, Tori Vega was not only the main character, but she was also the writer's favorite. So all the episodes would constantly revolve around propping Tori up as the most talented singer in the entire school, which is a hard task because Ariana Grande is there. So what do they do? They put down every single character, either by making them really, really stupid or just really, really mean and unlikable relegate them to being Tori's backup performers and give them barely any screen time. They snuff out the light of potential that all the other characters had because they would easily outshine their golden child otherwise. Why? Because it's easier to ruin other characters than to write the protagonist better. It's a sign of lazy, insecure writing. And that's exactly what happens in Miraculous Ladybug. So how do we fix this? There are three major things we need to change in order to properly address all of those issues I mentioned before. The first thing would be giving regular Adrian a more compelling personality and design that better reflects his background. For Adrian's personality, I really like the original concept Thomas had for Adrian's character, aka Felix, before he decided to include that character in the show as well and demonstrated just how poorly Thomas implements his ideas. And that made my job a bit harder because not only do I have to distinguish him from the real Adrian, but Felix too. But I think I might have an idea. Remember when I said earlier in this video that Adrian is actually pretty depressed and neglected? This is something the show kind of mentions in bits and pieces, but otherwise completely glosses over. See, Adrian's loss of his mother is very recent, and not only that, but his father has also completely shut him out. We have evidence in the show that Adrian couldn't cope with this fact either, because in the episode Felix, we're told that Adrian completely fell out of contact with Felix and wasn't able to offer support when Felix's father died because of it. We never see this on screen and we also never learn how Adrian managed to go back to just being himself as per Origins. He, he's just better guys, trust us. So I want to bring more focus into that in my rewrite. My first change would be that Adrian actually holds resentment towards his dad. After all, 
Gabriel almost completely removed himself from his son's life and abandoned him in his time of need, making Adrian feel like he'd lost both his parents when his mom disappeared. On top of that, he still forced his son to carry on with his extracurricular activities and demanded perfection from him at every turn. And before you say, oh, this is way too dark for a kid's show, I'm literally just reiterating what the show is already doing and using it as sources to inform my changes. And I think saying that Adrian would have a rocky, unpleasant relationship with his dad and a negative view of him isn't too far out of the realm of possibility. So to give an example of what I had in mind for Adrian, I'm going to rewrite his side in the Origins episode in season 1. The episode starts with Natalie telling Gabriel that Adrian has taken Emily's disappearance very hard and he's not coping. He has become very withdrawn and frustrated and he has become disinterested in all his usual activities. He just goes through the motions like he's on autopilot and is growing increasingly restless. He hasn't been sleeping or eating well and Natalie is worried about him. Gabriel being Gabriel brushes it off and thinks Adrian is just looking for attention and Adrian overhears this because he was eavesdropping on the conversation and that made him angry which establishes to the audience that he does not like his dad. He decides he can't stand being stuck in that mansion anymore so he decides he wants to go to regular school and the rest of the episode plays the same as the real Origins episode. The only difference is that when he gets lumped in with Chloe the first time he comes to class, it's not only because he's friends with her, but also because of his own attitude. He's been homeschooled all his life, has never made any friends of his own, and rarely interacts with other people his age, so I see him being awkward and out of place among his classmates. He's reserved, composed, and graceful, with perfect posture and perfectly practiced movements like, oh, I don't know, a supermodel? On top of that, he would also have this formal and sophisticated way of speaking while struggling to understand teen lingo, which makes the other kids think he's a rich snob like Chloe, when really he's just really awkward and as soon as he gets home that day, he buys a book on slangs and trendy words and reads it in the car. It also doesn't help that he has one of those faces that are just so handsome that it's intimidating. Of course, he proves himself to be a good person unlike Chloe. He's just never been around kids his age before and he does try his best to fit in and integrate himself into their social circle. And the rest of the students eventually warm up to him and help him come out of his shell bit by bit. Maybe it's even Marinette that convinces the other students that he's actually a pretty cool guy. After he gives her his umbrella when she forgot hers, she realizes that he's not like Chloe at all. And the next day, when she tells Alia and the other girls, they start gaslighting her that she has a crush on him and that he's really into her too. And Marinette, being as awkward and eager to please as she is, agrees as to not disappoint her friends which sets the precedent for her crush. But in my version, she's actually kind of on the fence about it since she doesn't really know him and she only acts like she likes him because it makes her feel like she fits in better with her friends. Gradually, feelings can start to develop between them as they get to know each other better, but we're not doing the whole obsessive stalker thing. As you probably saw in the background, I've given him a different wardrobe to how he's usually dressed in the show. You probably think it's a lot more muted and reflects his personality less than the original, but that's actually the point. The Adrian I'm going for is someone who is more of a perfectionist like his father and yet feels trapped by him at the same time. It was mentioned before that Adrian's wardrobe is meticulously organized by color and style to ensure that Adrian wears only the trendiest clothes and yet they dress him in that. Orange sneakers? Really? Why did Natalie ever let him leave the house and attend photo shoots looking like that? Yes, I assume that's exactly what a 14-year-old boy would dress like, but Adrian isn't just a regular 14-year-old boy. He's not 
Danny Fenton. He's a famous supermodel and his dad is the top designer in Paris. You would think Adrian would have better taste in fashion or at least have a professional stylist to pick out his clothes for him. Though I knew exactly what kind of outfit I wanted to put on Adrian, I actually struggled a lot when it came to deciding the colors, especially the pants. If you guys were in my Discord server or joined my stream with Mally Malware, you know that I practically went through the whole rainbow to try and find the best color for his pants and the outfit in general. But in the end, this monochrome palette was what I settled on. It doesn't scream Adrian, it's devoid of color and individuality, but it is stylish and exactly what you would expect on a fashion model. In fact, I also used violet as the shadows as an homage to Hawk Moth to show that this Adrian is much more under his father's control. I also toyed with his hair a bit to make it look brushed back in that expensive, rich person way. On top of that, I also wanted him to have earrings because he was mentioned to have ear piercings in the show, but they never really do anything with it except for one episode where he switches miraculouses with Marinette. The reason I went with sophisticated and stylish is so that I could contrast this more sharply in his cat noir design. See, the idea that Cat Noir is more of his true self really stuck to me, so I decided to incorporate that in my design. As Cat Noir, Adrian doesn't have the same burden or pressure as he does in his day-to-day -day life, and he finally has the freedom he's always yearned for. The costume that Adrian has is actually quite nice. I didn't initially plan on changing it, but after changing his regular wardrobe, I realized it was only half of the story I wanted to tell, so I had to redesign his cat noir suit as well. I want this cat noir to feel more liberated, wild, like a bird that's finally fled its cage. I knew his suit needed this feeling of imperfection, something rebellious and completely different from what he's usually allowed in his daily life. So, first thing I did was make his belt asymmetric. I probably could have emphasized it better by letting it fall a bit lower on his hip, but you live and learn. I wanted bursts of color to symbolize his true self shining through. I was really inspired by the scene in Encanto when Isabella finally let loose and got bursts of pollen on her dress. At first, I wanted to do a paint splatter pattern or a burst pattern as well, but I didn't think it really made sense with his theme. I even considered doing paw prints, but that made him seem more domesticated. Like a pet cat instead of a stray cat that's free to roam wherever it pleases. So I decided on a claw mark pattern. I think it communicated that wild, rebellious slide more effectively, while also staying true to the theme and breaking up the uniformity without taking away the fact that he's meant to be a black cat. I kept his hand and ankle guard things, but for extra protection, I also gave him some elbow and knee pads to make the suit look more like armor. Something I noticed while designing the suit was that the toes of Cat Noir's shoes are actually fashioned after cat paws. I thought that was a really nice touch, so I decided to keep that idea. I knew from the moment I decided to redesign his Cat Noir costume that I wanted his hair to be wild and chaotic, heavily inspired by Bakugo Katsuki from My Hero Academia, to contrast the meticulously styled hair he normally wears in his day-to-day -day life. I wanted his hair to make him look untamed, almost like a wild animal, and I made sure his facial expression matched that chaos. One thing I actually didn't like about the Cat Noir suit is the awkwardly large, awkwardly placed bell that's on his chest. It feels really… I don't know, it toes a bit too close to adult things especially with all the uncomfortable double talk between Ladybug and Cat Noir. It really doesn't help. For instance, in the episode Puppeteer, Cat Noir says to Ladybug, You know I like being in command, which I think can be taken in the wrong way very easily. You're 14, Adrian. Oh, that was also the episode where Ladybug says, I don't like the idea of Cat Noir rummaging around in my room. Yeah, I guess that would be pretty invasive and uncomfortable, wouldn't it, Marinette? 
and the show moves on. But the bottom line is, I don't like the current Belle placement, but I know that that's probably the one thing Adrian himself chose to have on his suit, as mentioned in Frightening Gale, so I decided to keep it, and I just moved it to his handguard thingies, so now he has two. For a while, I wasn't sure what to do with his collar. After moving the bell, it was important that I actually did something with the collar so that it doesn't look too plain, and I wanted to give him something unique like I did for Marinette. I just wasn't sure what yet. But as I outlined the drawing, it suddenly came to me. Given how chaotic and wild I made him be, it's obvious that he needs to have an open collar. So I essentially unzipped that part of his suit and I was really pleased with myself because it made the design feel a lot more casual and rebellious. It also contrasted the elegant turtleneck he wears in his average life. I knew that I wanted to make his hair darker as cat noir, making it more brassy than golden. I think it would help conceal his identity a bit better and creates coherence with his suit. Let me know what you guys think of my new design. The next change I want to make is Cat Noir's role and function in the show. This includes changes to his powers and his dynamic with Ladybug. So let's start with his powers. I mentioned in the beginning of the video that Adrian is the holder of the Cat Miraculous, which holds the power of destruction. It is the counterpart of the Ladybug Miraculous, and the two need each other to stay in balance. Or something to that effect. I actually got quite a few comments about this in my last video, so I want to clarify that I know her power is creation, so a lot of you were complaining that the damage reversal I talked about was a creation power, and that's the whole point. But I'm sorry, you're wrong, because it's not, and let me explain why. Ladybug's power fixes things. Her power doesn't just create things. It also eliminates things like stormy weather's ice and siren's flood. What does that have anything to do with creation? Like, for damaged buildings and streets and cars, I can reason that the magic ladybugs create new buildings and cars to replace the damaged ones, but what about the leftover debris or civilians that were transformed by the villain's powers or straight up devoured by the villains? Do the ladybugs just create new people to replace the old ones? Does that mean everyone Marinette knows, including her parents and Adrian himself, are just clones of their original selves? Makes you think. But this observation also made me realize that Ladybug toes on Cat Noir's destruction ability quite a bit, because her ladybugs are capable of breaking things down just as well as Cat Noir's cataclysm. When the whole concept of destroying things is the only thing that the Cat Miraculous has going for it. Ladybug is the only hero who is capable of de-evilizing Akumas. She is also capable of breaking whatever item the Akuma hides in. And technically she can still smash stuff with her yo-yo. So mechanically speaking, what is the Cat Miraculous balancing out? The Ladybug Miraculous seems to do only good, so it doesn't need the Cat Miraculous to keep it in check. It seems more like the Ladybug Miraculous is there to clean up after the Cat Miraculous, because with the existence of villains and humans in general, you don't really need a magical creature to cause destruction. Again, there's a big power imbalance between Ladybug and Cat Noir, so whereas I powered Ladybug down, I want to power Cat Noir up. If Ladybug is the only hero that can de-evilize Akumas, I want it so that only Cat Noir can break whatever item the Akuma is hiding in. Maybe in my version, the items are protected by some sort of magic that makes it practically indestructible, and only Cat Noir, who holds the power of destruction, can break it. So that way, the responsibilities are more evenly distributed and it's not just the Ladybug show. Because Cat Noir is also in the title. I mentioned before that Ladybug doesn't really need Cat Noir to turn the entire city back to normal, right? Which implies that her Ladybugs themselves are capable of breaking things down, aka destroying them, and then building them back up like new. In that case, 
Why does Hawk Moth even need Cat Noir's Miraculous? The Ladybug Miraculous does everything by itself just fine. See, if Ladybug's powers were strictly about creation, then the debris left over from their battles would still be there, right? Like, if Glaciator's ice cream covered a whole street, then Ladybug wouldn't be able to fix it because it would require her to destroy the ice cream and get rid of it, right? Or if civilians were turned into stone golems like in Stoneheart, wouldn't Cat Noir's power be more useful since he would be able to destroy the armor in stone? I think the show fails to really balance the power of the cat in Ladybug Miraculous, so it leans really heavily in Ladybug's favor. And instead, the most use they get out of it is soulmate baiting to convince the audience that Marinette and Adrian were made for each other, as if it hasn't been shoved down our throats enough times. So my idea is, what if instead of only Ladybug turning the city back to normal, it has to be both her and Cat Noir using their powers together? Destruction and creation working together to restore everything to its former state, a net zero. And instead of yelling Miraculous Ladybug, they could both yell out Miraculous or something. But that's not all. I also want to change how his dynamic with Ladybug works. See, I think this wild and rebellious Tom is more of a free spirit than a faithful sidekick and simp. A loose cannon, if you will. He doesn't just follow Ladybug around, he shows up wherever and whenever he wants and Ladybug doesn't always have him under control or know what he's up to, but he always pulls through in the end. So, whereas Ladybug is the straight-laced goody two-shoes who is Paris's golden child, Cat Noir is more of the dark horse. This could even be a point of character development because in the actual show, Ladybug is very much a control freak who cares a lot about following a plan, to the point the other characters have to remain idle without her around. So while creation is her main power, another aspect to Ladybug that I notice is that she also represents order. But because of that, it makes her predictable because she's not open to other perspectives and is set on doing things the way she wants to do them. It's her way or the highway. Meanwhile, in my version, Cat Noir hates being told what to do, because that's what his life is usually like, so he's a lot more spontaneous and unpredictable. It's coherent with how Plague is as a Kwame, and I think it better represents Cat Noir as a wielder of destruction, and as Ladybug's opposite, chaos. Chaos and order go hand in hand to create balance, because one can't exist without the other. But because they're polar opposites, Ladybug could not work with him at first. But she learns that if she lets go of control a bit more and puts more trust in the autonomy of others, it makes them a better team. After all, cats do whatever they want and they don't take orders unless they decide they want to do it in the first place. I think a big plot point for Adrian that they should have done in the show but didn't is for him to investigate where his mom went. It made sense that he didn't really question it when he was just an average boy, but now he has the means to get around by himself and sneak into places. I think it gives Adrian a purpose outside of just being Marinette's love interest and the writer's punching bag. Knowing Plague, I don't think he would really care much about Adrian using his powers for that, since Plague gives off the impression that he's a lenient parent who lets their kids get into fights as long as they win. So I think it would be a fun side quest for Adrian to try and figure out where his mother went since his dad isn't forthcoming. But because of this, he catches Hawk Moth's attention because now he knows Cat Noir is looking for his wife. And maybe that could lead into a storyline where Hawk Moth decides to meet Cat Noir in person to try and manipulate him into giving him his and Ladybug's miraculous, telling him that it will bring Emily back. Obviously, Cat Noir doesn't trust him, and not knowing that Cat Noir is actually his son, Hawk Moth takes him to the secret basement in the aggressed mansion and shows him the state Emily is in after being poisoned by the Peacock Miraculous, which causes Adrian to realize that not only is Hawk Moth his father, his mother is also dead, just like in the episode Cat Blanc. Except, 
They're not in the heat of battle and Hawk Moth is being very open and earnest with Cat Noir, in an attempt to manipulate him, of course. Understandably, Cat Noir is shocked and horrified by the truth, but instead of fighting Hawk Moth, he runs away and Hawk Moth lets him go, knowing he'll come back. Cat Noir slash Adrian is completely torn up by his discoveries and he pretty much breaks down again just like when his mother first disappeared. He knows the truth, but he doesn't tell Ladybug because although he's not very fond of his father, he still loves him and wants to protect him. And now he understands why Hawk Moth is doing what he's doing. This time, it's Marinette that's out of the loop. Maybe Adrian is even tempted to help him achieve his goal, because he also wants to bring his mother back. That gives the writers a chance to make an episode where Cat Noir turns on Ladybug to try and steal her miraculous without him necessarily being akumatized by Hawk Moth. But ultimately, he comes to accept the fact that his mother was gone and that she wouldn't want what Gabriel was doing for her sake. And bringing her back to life would only cause more harm than good. So now, his new goal is to reconcile with his father, help him see the error of his ways, and move on from his grief. And with that, let me know what you guys think of my redesign and rewrite. Did you like it? Dislike it? Did you agree or disagree with me? Let me know in the comments below because I always read all my comments. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss my videos. Check out my comic because that will make me really happy. And I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye!